Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a terrific group of guests on a great topic and a lot to talk about. Let me take a step back. Ever since our beginning in 2016, the Future Trends Forum has examined how to improve teaching and learning. And we've hit that from any number of angles. And you can go back into our archive and see a whole bunch of sessions about that. But since 2020, for the past really two and a half years, two things have happened to change that conversation. First, there's been the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has forced, among other things, higher education massively online for a time, but also brought instructional design, instructional designers to the forefront for the first time. And we have a lot of questions about how best to teach, not just digitally, but also in general. And the second thing, we've had a kind of recommitment to social justice. And this has occurred on numerous axes, including gender, including race, including disability. And that's what making educators rethink everything from tenure promotion, hiring and review, to the names of buildings, and especially teaching and learning. So those two combined, social justice and the pandemic, have made us rethink and reimagine what does it mean to teach and learn in the 21st century. Now, this week's guests have worked on, written, and edited two great new books. If you haven't seen them, just click on the bottom left of your screen. You'll see a button cleverly labeled, The Two Books. And this will bring you up to them. And to their credit, you can download those books in three different ways. You can actually have a print one sent to your home. You can download a Kindle version, or you can click right on the web and read the entire thing for free, which is wonderful. Now, I have a whole bunch of questions. I have a whole bunch to say. But what I'd rather do instead of doing that is to bring these folks up on stage so that you can talk to them. And I'd like to start off. Uh, by bringing the person I think is the lead cat herder for this whole event, um, a wonderful, wonderful thinker, instructional designer, just a terrific person, Martha Burtis. So let me hit a button and bring her up on stage. Hello, Martha. Hi, Brian. It's so good to see you. It's where, great to be here. Where are you today? Um, I am in my office at the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Fantastic. And is uh, fall just starting to be felt there? It is. We actually are getting down into the 40s, I think, tonight, Ooh. tomorrow night. And I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, the leaves must be turning already. Just starting. Oh, my Good gosh. time to live in New Hampshire. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, wonderful. Enjoy. But li listen, Martha, we have a tradition on the forum. When we ask people to introduce themselves, we don't ask them to look at the past. We ask them to think about the future. <laughs> So let me ask, what are you going to be working on for the next year or so? What are the big projects or tasks and what are the big ideas that are top of your mind? Uh, great question. So here in the uh, collab, as we call it at PSU, I work with my colleagues, Robin DeRosa, um, Matthew Cheney and Hannah Hounsel, and we've got a big new faculty development program that we launched this past spring that is in many ways um, premised on the idea of critical instructional design mm. um, it's called Design Forward. Mm -hmm. And we spent about a year sort of designing it, um, working with uh, small groups here at PSU to really hone in on what we wanted it to be. Um, working on these volumes has been hugely beneficial to me as we've been putting together that program. So we're doing um, different modules essentially every semester. We're going to start an intro to pedagogy one in about a week. And then we've got one in October and November on um, teaching online called Formats and Modalities. And mm -hmm. here I show and tell, my, my, one of my favorite pieces of it is this, which is a, it's backwards on your screen. No, it's, it's, right. it's kind of a workbook that we've put together uh -huh. um, of exercises and activities that go along with the critical instructional design approach that we're trying to um, really infuse into Design Forward. And I'm hoping this year to really get that workbook digitized and available for other people to use. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Well, I envy your faculty for this opportunity and envy the students for the results. <laughs> well, that's terrific. Well, welcome. Right. Welcome. Welcome. Let me, uh, let me bring on stage your colleagues and uh, let's just go after these folks one by one and uh, bring them all up. Um, so let me bring up Andrew David King. Let's see where he is. All right. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, Brian. Thanks so much for having me. Or I should say good morning if you're on the West Coast. I am on the West Coast, yeah. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, and are you on Berkeley's campus right now? 
I'm not. Um, I am uh, a, a little ways away where I live in the suburbs. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I would ask you weather questions, but there's a limit to my masochism. Um, so, <laughs> but I'm, I'm delighted that you can join us. Um, tell us, as, as you heard me just tell Martha, we would like to introduce in a forward facing way. What are, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big topics and the big projects? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm in a moment of major life transition. I just began a doctoral program at Berkeley in English. Um, my primary research interests are um, American poetry, the long 20th century, and then uh -huh. studies. Um, I have a background in philosophy too. Um, I just completed a master's um, at Central European University, um, working on uh, an issue at the intersection of aesthetics and the philosophy of disability, which Jared has heard some things about because it was a reason why. Uh, I was uh, sort of waylaid, um, but anyway, so that's all. That's all in the bag. Um, so I'm 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 trying to um, to, to reorient myself to think about um, my uh, my academic future, um, and at the same time, I've become involved in disability advocacy at UC Berkeley, which is something that I did at a couple of prior institutions, CEU, and then also UC Davis, where I was very briefly. Um, so I'm currently the um, the project director for something called the Disabled Students Advocacy Project led by the Graduate Assembly at Berkeley. Um, and I work with uh, graduate students across departments um, to liaise and try to form partnerships and allyships to advocate for um, the needs of disabled students. Uh, and it's sort of broadly, broadly construed, um, uh, and uh, uh, it's a group of which I'm a member. Um, so I'm trying to think about ways to, uh, to be effective in that role and then also to uh, how to have that um, that practical pursuit sort of live beside my my academic aspirations. So a nice uh, nice bit of praxis there. Very good. Uh, well, for, that's terrific work, Andrew, and 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 good luck and congratulations on this new graduate program for you. Uh, as an English PhD myself, I can only commiserate. Um, but. <laughs> Now, Andrew, uh, let me uh, put, let me have, welcome you to the stage. But also, we have two more folks. So let me bring up on the stage Jess O'Reilly, and let's see if we've got Jess here. Drum roll, please. Hello, Jess. Hello. <laughs> so good to see you. So good to see you. Where are you today? Uh, I'm in Swakamak, so that is Anishinaabe Moen Ojibwe, for where the three roads meet. Mm -hmm. um, also known as Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. So about four hours north of Toronto. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So if, if I were to ask you about the weather, you would probably say the leaves are turning and you're starting to look to the long winter ahead. Well, I was in the lake yesterday and um, it was almost freezing overnight. So oh, yeah, it's oh, happening. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's, that's it. Well, you and Martha, you are in the North Country. You know about how this works. Jess, what, what are you working on for the next year? What are you looking forward to? Um, so I'm looking forward to finally finishing my doctorate. Um, I've, uh, I'm year six of a five year uh, <laughs> doctorate yeah. in distance education program through Athabasca University, which is sure. an online university yeah. in Canada. Um, so I've been working on my dissertation project for some time now, and yeah. I'm working toward the final stages. I, I'm not quite in the final stage. That takes a bit of time. Uh, time and committee liaison, but um, I'm through data collection, I'm into the analysis and the write-up piece. So I'm oh, confident great. and hopeful that I'll be finishing that project up this, let's call it this academic year. <laughs> Very good. Keep going. Keep going. We're behind you. And we want to see the result. Thank dissertation you. on educational technology is up our alley. So we'd mm. love to see that. Well, good luck, Jess. Good luck. And welcome. Welcome to the forum. Well, three is not enough. Uh, we have to have even more. Um, and so let me bring up the fourth member of our esteemed crew. And let me see if I can find him here. And here is the man with the best background item on the panel today. Hello, yeah. rock and roll, Jared. Good to see you. I labored over which guitar to hang because you can't have one guitar. That's not that's not nearly enough. So you have to have like eight. And so I, I spread them out today. And I was like, who gets to make the wall? But, well, which one is this? And what is this? It is the Epiphone three ninety nine. If you have seen the big hollow bodies like the Gibson three fifty five or three thirty five, this is the version for short people like me. So you don't feel like you're playing dad's guitar. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad to see you playing your guitar metaphorically and literally. Well, what are you going to be working on, Jared, for the next year? What's ahead for you? Yeah, I've got two big projects. Um, the, the one most inter interesting to this audience is probably that I will be building my second acoustic guitar out of Osage Orange and Red Spruce. So I finished oh. my first one this past January and I'm oh. moving on to number two because again, one's never enough. And the other one is in the Tour to Critical Instructional Design book. I've got a chapter on quality course rubrics and reviews. Yes. And it is not flattering to those rubrics. No. And so my next year, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And I'm designing and testing and piloting uh, a bet what I would consider a better way, a more effective way to do online course quality that focuses on faculty student connections, inclusion, and a little bit of course structure, and really emphasizes the autonomy and the experience of the instructors. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I'm glad to see you building. I mean, your chapter was a uh, 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 ferocious and very thoughtful takedown. Um, but to, you know, then to show what we can do instead is is terrific. Yeah. Well, good luck and, and you. welcome, Jared. Welcome to all four of you. Um, here on, on the Future Trends Forum, this is a venue for group conversation. I want to kick things off by asking you a couple of just basic questions. And again, for everybody, especially if you're just joining us, look in the bottom left of the screen for a button that says the two books, and that'll take you to the two books directly, uh, whichever format you like. Um, let me ask just if each of you could, could reply to this question. Um, what does uh, kind of humanitarian uh, uh, design for education look like now after two and a half years of COVID and social justice mobilization? What are some of the key themes that you want us to bear in mind as we all work in higher education? Now, there's four of you, so you're going to have to fight. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm happy to get us kicked off. Um, I would. I like this question because um, it it kind of helps me think a little bit about how I ended up where I where I am working on these volumes, and in this conversation today. Um, because in um, January of I guess 2021, after you know we had all survived. Well, I should say, not everybody did. Um, but as we had gotten through the first um, full semester of living with um, COVID um, among us, I kind of looked around and thought, wow, in my entire career working in, you know, educational technology, di digital pedagogy, um, faculty development, instructional design, I've never witnessed so much activity and conversation and innovation around pedagogy, right? Um, and it happened out of necessity, but it still happened. And it was um, exhausting <laughs> and awful at times, yeah. but it was also sort of revelatory at times. And I thought, I wonder where this is gonna go from here because there are a lot of different places it could go. And I was worried about A, the, the, the thread getting lost, but I was also maybe even more worried about some of the trends that I was witnessing that I felt like were, were working against what I thought was most important in this moment, which was focusing on people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and so I really started talking at that point with friends and colleagues. Um, it's why we kicked off the Design Forward program here at Plymouth State. It's why when um, Sean Michael Morris originally reached out to me and asked if I wanted to be a co-editor of this volume, I happily agreed. and. It, and it also led to a couple other pieces that um, Jesse Stommel and I wrote that spring and summer. And now it's been hard to believe another year and a half later, we're still in the midst of all of this. And I would say it's even more um, terrifying <laughs> in some ways because I feel like we're losing, we are losing the thread in a lot of places. Um, we, at, at my institution, we definitely have this, um, sort of, and, and I should say that I'm very incredibly grateful to what my institution did to support me and my colleagues during the last, I mean, truly, truly, they went above and beyond over the last two years. But I think we are, 
we're hearing the same thing lots of people are hearing, which is, oh, things are getting back to normal and um, it's better to be face to face. That's what we need. That's what our students need. We need to go back to the way things were. Um, and A, I don't think that's possible. I don't think we can erase the last two and a half years of experience and how it's imprinted on all of us as educators and teachers and learners. But B, I think we're losing an opportunity uh -huh. to take those lessons that we learned out of, out of necessity uh -huh. and figure out how to take them forward with us um, and to use them to, to create a more just university. Um, and it, I, so I think this is a really, really important conversation for us to be having right now. Well, thank you. A more just university is a very, very great phrase for this. Yeah. Thank you, Martha. Yeah. Jess, Jared, Andrew, what would you add to this? I would, I would expand. I would see. I, I've seen the same thing at my own university. Um, Wake Forest University is where I work, um, <clears throat> where there was this this explosion, this um, of oh man, we have to change, and we did things differently, and we and we did things differently. Yes. And and now there's the um, what do you call it the I'm in the Midwest, so forgive me if I'm using this expression on a bit of a riptide to pull back. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what oceans are, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, pull back to the way things were and we can't go back. I mean, for Pete's sake, I'm sitting at my desk at my home, right. still within reach of a COVID-19 at home test. Sure. I mean, that's, that's, we're not going back. But I also see not just the universities and folks, people saying, no, no, see, exactly but we see um, professional organizations and our conferences saying, oh man, we, we went online for the last couple of years out of necessity and learned that there's many of our, our members in our population who, because they're taking care of their parents, because they've got kids, because of all kinds of reasons, um, can't up and leave for a week and fly across the country uh, to go for professional development and so again, having to do something different, uh, our professional organizations are also in a space where we say, oh, why don't we do both? Why don't we do both and? Why does, why mm -hmm. does it have to be either or? Mm -hmm. And so it's still, just like in, in the university, it's still a tension between um, wanting, to, wanting to do both and wanting to just pretend things are, I'm sorry, that's rude, I don't care, just to pretend things are over. Um, but yeah. I see it spreading. <clears throat> Well, we definitely see that attitude in, in the U.S. Um, on Inside Higher Ed, Josh Kim had a good piece about the, the desire for a snapback uh, to try and return to fall 2019. Um, and uh, I think that would lose a lot of the lessons that you just two described. Um, thank you, Jared. Uh, Jess, Andrew, would you like to add any more? Go ahead, Andrew. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks, Brian. That's one lesson, you know, despite three years of Zoom teaching, it still gets me. Everyone gets um, it. Everyone gets it. Uh, um, what I was saying was, uh, I don't have too much uh, new, I don't have too much new content to add to what Martha and Jared have already said, uh, besides echoing and affirming it. Um, I'm, I, uh, in particular, uh, took myself to be saying one part of the, the my chapter in Designing for Care is something very like, very much alike to like what Martha uh, just said about um, uh, you know, needing uh, uh, needing to, to think about the uh, the possibilities for these new technologies, the ways they can be liberatory, can make the university more just, um, and we're sort of at a risk of um, of failing to to really uh, fully learn and take those lessons and bring them into the future. Um, I mean, I think. There was a point at which this conversation was about what are we going to do post pandemic and now that the pandemic seems to be endemic um the conversation is what do we do just period right yeah, um, yeah. The, the threat of losing yeah the, the losing of these things uh of these lessons seems to be um something that's happening very very quickly um and in ways that are um, disappointing and surprising and i've seen this at all the institutions that i've had the opportunity to to be involved with disability related advocacy uh, uh, to some extent. Um, right now, just to speak about the current situation in UC Berkeley, um, there is really no institutional academic cultural conversation going on about a potential switch back to hybrid, who hybrid, 
teaching might be useful for. It's all done on an ad hoc basis. And the rhetoric is again reverted back to, we want, in, you know, uh, virtual instruction is not ideal. Virtual instruction is, you know, it's, it's effectively denigrated. Uh, and I'm not, I'd be first to register a number of complaints with, or, or possible you know, drawbacks to virtual instruction. Um, but to act like this isn't a huge, well, first of all, a huge potential to disable the students or people who are at high risk from COVID. And then to act as if it's it, being asked to do it as being asked to move heaven and earth seemed to me, um, I, I, you know, after having had several years of, of, in fact, doing it and, and gaining institutional and professional fluency with it, seems to me ludicrous. So that's one of the things I'm currently trying to work on is to build coalitions um, of graduate students and faculty who want to develop some, even if it's not enshrined in policy, some, some kind of consensus around what we think is the equitable, equitable approach to, to, you know, to teaching where students might not be able to come into the classroom because of their particular needs, or you know, um, just because they're sick and don't want to spread it to their fellow students and don't and shouldn't be punished for that. Um, yeah. That was actually a conversation. I shouldn't share too much here, but um, that had to happen recently in a, in a context in which I was a member. It's like it was sort of remarkable to me how quickly that 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 sense of of, of courtesy to others is is lost. And so um, my my take, uh, I should just say, you know, as as a disabled person, as someone who works with um, folks, uh, you know, in, in all the sort of uh, all their issues where they face uh, institutional ableism, my my take may be a little bit more cynical, but I think um, I'm not less hopeful for that. I mean, I'm cynical about the attitudes of the institutions, maybe, but I'm a little bit. But um, Andrew, I found I found your chapter not cynical, but very thoughtful, very critical, and very moving. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Brian. Well, and thank you for these comments. Uh, we just had a couple of uh, one comment in the chat. I just wanted to hoist up there from uh, Sarah Thompson, who says, uh, "Focus within higher education must include the well-being of faculty and staff, in addition to students, when thinking about the pandemic." So thank you, Sarah. Jess, what would you like to add? What is this? Yeah, uh, I think uh, Sarah's comment kind of echoes the thoughts that have been bouncing around my brain as, as cool. my uh, panelists have shared. Um, we were thrown in there. Um, it, in my context, we had a weekend to figure it out. Remember that fun cool. word, pivot? And there, there wasn't really a whole lot of um, care or attention given to the fact that we were all in a state of crisis. And, and for me, I think it just underscores how our systems generally um, are structured such that we have maybe one very clearly defined on-ramp tends to happen during the admission cycle, and then so many off-ramps, um, and students can take those off-ramps at any time, it really commodifies um, their experience down to a dollars and cents um, bottom line. And for me, as a student, as well as a faculty member, I felt that directly. Um, last year, my father passed from cancer. And on the day that he died, I got an email from my institution asking me to pay my program fees and give them an update about my progress on my dissertation. And it's moments like that, that really mm -hmm. underscore how broken and flawed and lacking humanity so much of higher ed um, is kind of mired in. But I do believe there can be a different way. And I think that um, focusing on the people uh, that we're in relationship with can, for me at least, help sustain me as I'm implicit in this colonial system for which I work and also uh, learn. I think it's... Um, I, I'm trying to be optimistic that change can come with uh, from within and through the people who are involved. Um, for example, something that didn't come up yet was the uncritical adoption of these very deeply problematic education technologies. They'd been around, but I think their usage massively um, increased during the pandemic. Ooh. Take, for example, those um, you know exam proctoring software um, tools that, for so many reasons, are unethical, and uh, we've seen the fights that have had to happen subsequently to 
ask institutions to adopt a level of criticality and care before the ubiquitous usage of, of such problematic ed tech. So there's one example I think of, I, I believe there is an evolution of thought and rather than the trite solutionism that we've seen in instructional design uh, context in the past, we might be moving to a place that is a little bit more nuanced and critical and person-centered, uh, or at least I hope. Um, so I, I do battle cynicism <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah. I am a unionist. I represent my uh, faculty union. Um, and I definitely see a problem with work-life balance when we're asked to do all the things all the time. So you're face-to-face, -face, you're online, you're asynchronous. There's all these words that are being invented to basically call a thing, which used to be teaching, um, a new name, which is teach three different ways all at the same time. Um, and, and that, for me, is something that I think we need to keep a close, close eye on because that will lead to huge consequences for faculty well-being um, and student well-being as well. When you're sick, you should be able to be sick and stay home and rest. And this um, understanding that, well, you can learn anywhere, anytime can become problematic if we don't set limits. And those limits are our own bodies and cognition and uh, need to have holistic wellness and balance in our lives. Well, that's really, really well said. Uh Thank you, Jess, and I commend everyone to uh, Jess's uh, wonderful chapter. Uh, very personal, uh, very thoughtful, uh, and again, very, very engaging and moving uh, in, the, uh, in the second book, uh, Click, Click, Connect. Um, friends, uh, I want to step out of the way and stop asking questions. Um, I would love to hear from you all, um, everyone, all nearly 100 of you. I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts and questions, and uh, I actually don't have to ask you that. Uh, because they're already coming in. Uh, so let me just uh, begin by uh, grabbing a question from, who is this? This is uh, Alex N. Carley, uh, a man with a fantastic beard, by the way. Um, and uh, Alex asks, how might we involve as broad a diversity of people in our work as possible instead of limiting ourselves to like-minded people? Great question. And who wants to try that? Well, you know, as a, as a classroom instructor, I'll call on you if you don't. Like that. I know, right? I think we're all just trying to be polite. Um, I, I'll take that one. I think it's a, a great question, a very um, tricky one. I think at all of our institutions, um, we probably, have, and within higher ed, just more generally, um, we have all kinds of sort of hidden codes, I would say that we use to signal sort of who we are and and to connect with other people who maybe share those same that same language those same codes the same background and sometimes we don't acknowledge what those are we don't really ask ourselves we don't really unpack that i guess is the way i would say and so i think the way we start this work is by spending some time trying to identify what it is in our practices that may be um, maybe not creating space for people who are coming at this from different perspectives with different contexts, different experiences and different backgrounds. I mean, a really gross and obvious example of this that you hear is, um, you know, on search committees when when you'll come down to a couple of candidates and and somebody will be rejected because it's not a good fit, right? And like, un if you unpack that word, there's a lot going on there. And almost always it's something that we should be examining and asking ourselves what we mean by it. Um, so I think really the, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, I tried to reach out to people and they, they weren't interested or I couldn't, you know, when I put out a, a call for interests, I, di I didn't get a diverse group of people asking to be engaged or asking to be in par a part of something that I'm working on or something I want to collaborate on. And I think always maybe we, what we need to start with 
is looking at ourselves and saying, is there something about the way that I, I pr am presenting this work or the way, or the, the communities I'm reaching out to, the people who I'm asking for input, what can I be doing to kind of break down some of those barriers that maybe I haven't acknowledged um, about how I work and how I present my work to bring more people into the fold? Um, those are my first thoughts about that. I would love to hear what my collaborators think as well. Great thoughts, great thoughts. Jared, Jess, Andrew, you guys jump in? I'd, I'd tag on that too, um, as far as approach for making space. Um, I've, I've, I've been doing this work for 15 years. I've been online for a long time. I've been in higher ed since I was an undergrad a lifetime ago. And one of the things I have to do intentionally myself is I got, I got vision and ideas for days, but that doesn't mean I have to drive every car. You know, where are my colleagues, where are my coworkers have their ideas and how can I support them? Instead of trying to say, oh, let's do my thing again all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got great things, I'm not gonna lie. But <laughs> it's like, instead of trying to ask why aren't people coming along with me? Why can't I bring a diverse population with me? It's like, oh, Maybe I maybe I should go along with someone else and help bring what I my skills and my thoughts and my experience to support their vision. I might be able to jump in with a story that kind of uh, picks up on this thread. If you haven't <laughs> read my chapter, I understand the world very much through story and um, something that uh, came up last spring. So first time I was invited back on campus was to honor our students who were convocating last year and the year prior. Uh, we invited those graduates back as well. And um, so I was invited to participate in an Indigenous drumming circle that was going to open and close the ceremonies through honor songs, the Nishnabe Megeze, the Eagle Song, and then the Traveling Song. Cool. And um, so our purpose was to sing these songs in honor of our graduates. And that drove all kinds of people together into a room. And I remember taking a moment and stepping back and thinking, wow, look at this. There's faculty, students, management, graduates, community members, like if this was an official committee, we would have hit all those like necessary markers that they look for in terms of representation. But nobody made a thing out of it. We sang our songs, we told our jokes, we, we you know, um, ate together, of course, because that's like essential. Um, and I thought, maybe that's what it's about. It's about shared purpose. So if you're asking the right question or focusing on the proper goal, maybe that brings um, the people to the room who are meant to be there. And I mean, room metaphorically could have been Zoom as well. But to me, it just underscored how sometimes these like more contrived, um, you know, we need to get a certain type of representation happening and it's part of our um, official operating procedures. That's a very colonial way of doing what the First Peoples have always been so good at, which is bringing many to the fire. All as equals, all as welcome voices. And I think that comes from a, a sense of humility, uh, mm. big time, but also a shared purpose and goal. Um, so, so I think that picks up on what Jared is saying, like maybe it's not just about pushing through my own agenda or an institutional agenda, but rather um, jumping into projects and ideas that are focused on these big problems that, that people truly care about. Because if students care about it, they'll show up. If they're not showing up, they're also speaking in that way too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, thank you. Uh, great question. Um, uh, Alex and uh, in in the chat, uh, Karen Belliner gives us a terrific prompt. She recommends us to invite our enemies early and with open arms. Extending a listening ear can work wonders sometimes. Um, I love that that sense of gathering around the fire, Jess. Uh, great, great answers. Thank you, and thank you for the question. We have more questions coming in, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to uh, to run at them. Uh, we have uh, our. Uh, our longtime friend, uh, Tom Hames, who has a question. Uh, how does humane education deal with the inhumane systems of industrial education that we've designed explicitly or implicitly over the last century plus? Um, 
Jared just looked like he was about to grab the microphone. So I think you have something to say. Why don't you give it a run? Yeah. Uh, I know Jess mentioned cynicism early, so apologies in advance if this comes through. I think I think what we're seeing a lot in the last three years, especially, is people giving up. I'm going corporate. I've seen so many of my colleagues who have done really great work for the last 10 years and more just get worn to the bone. And like, I don't know if the grass is greener on the other side, but it's time to try. And so I see that that's one way. So we're losing passionate, knowledgeable, spirited people because we're just beat down. Um, so unfortunately, that's one way I see. Um, yeah. As far as, or as far as systems, you know, I'm always thinking about like, all right, my department is all of four people for a whole university. What can I actually do? Like for reals, what, what can I actually do? And just trying to do our piece as a whole really, really well. Cause I can't, I can't, I, I've got a, I forgot where I said it, but I had a line where I can't instructional design somebody out of food insecurity. That's what can I do? Um, so I'm going to try to focus on what I can do really well to help the students, to help the faculty, so they don't get burned out and go corporate. Because um, we've got a lot of great faculty here doing the same thing. Nothing against going to work for another outside of higher ed. But it's, that's, unfortunately, that's what I've seen mostly in the last few years is we're just getting run out. Melody uh, Buckner in the chat says, if you're going to get burned out, at least you can get paid for it. Yep. Well, Man, I've heard that so many times in the last yeah. three years. Well, this is a darker answer to Tom's question. Um, yeah. What about the rest Sorry. of you? Any thoughts about how to humanize a system that was designed to be inhumane? Yeah, I, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> and absolutely none of them are, like, absolutely none of them are, like, things anybody should write down and be like, okay, now I know how to do that. Um, because there's just, there obviously is no simple answer to this question, but I will say a couple things that come to mind for me. And one of which is, and actually I was already thinking about this because you had mentioned somebody in the chat talking about inviting your enemy mm -hmm. to the space. And I was thinking about that and how, uh, how that makes a lot of sense, but also how we aren't all positioned to be able to um, deal with our um, asking vulnerable people to invite their enemy <laughs> into the space is not necessarily a great, is not necessarily the best practice. So, but we do, but in keeping with whoever made that comment, we do want to, we do want to find some sort of way forward, right? So how do we do that? And this gets back to the question at hand. I think so much of this has to do with coalition right? So much of this has to do with us finding out how we work collectively um, and not alone. Mm. Um, and, and that means, so in the question of inviting your enemies, it means that you need to be part of a coalition where if, if you're not capable, if you're, if you're in a vulnerable spot where you really can't engage with your enemy that way, you've got somebody who can help with that. You've got somebody you can turn to. You've got somebody you can rely on. Um, when it comes to humanizing education in the face of the increasing commercialization and corporatization and solutionism, as just alluded to earlier, talk about a word that like keeps me up at night, um, that's plaguing higher education. None of us as individuals can, it's just, you can, you can make difference in your classroom, right? To a certain extent, although as Jared has just said, you can instructional design away hunger right? Mm -hmm. But in coalition, we can do a lot. Mm. Uh, we can do a lot more. I'm not saying we can, you know, fix everything, but we can always achieve more in collective than we can individually. It's hard. It's hard to do collective work. Um, one of the things that's that I've been mulling over for the last year or so, in part because of COVID, is the concept of mutual aid in education and the, the, the metaphor mutual aid is a metaphor essentially within education. And partly this is because when this may have happened in many of your communities, but in my community, when, when in March of 2020, when our 29, yeah, 2020, when things got locked down, a mutual, uh, several mutual aid um, 
um, movements popped up in my local community. And it was really, um, it was a, it was amazing to watch. It was hard to watch. It was important to watch and see that unfold. And as it was happening, I was thinking, there's something here about learning. There's something here about teaching. There's something here about how we work collectively towards something together that's bigger than any one of us. And I, and I keep coming back to that and thinking we need to figure out how to build mutual aid network into the work we do um, in our institutions, across our institutions, across the faculty and student divide. This is another thing I keep coming back to. One of the things I love about Andy's piece in the book is that it's all about what it means to be a, a, a body, right? Like what it means to be embodied mm. and, and, and trying to be part of this work. And in, in when we're thinking about human, like infusing humanity into our work, one of the things that happened during COVID is we all realized that like, we all have bodies, right? Like every one of us was vulnerable in all the same ways. And so these weird power divides of administration and faculty and faculty and students and staff and faculty meant nothing because we all have bodies that are vulnerable. And if there's one thing I want us to take forward out of this, it's remembering what that was like to realize, for a student to realize, oh, my professor is suffering, right? Like something we would have hidden before, something we wouldn't have shared, but we couldn't not share it, you know? And, and I want us to remember what it was like when we first realized, oh, my students can't find food. Yeah. Like they, my students living in a tent because they can't go home to be with their parents because they're afraid of them getting sick. Um, one of the, the pieces from our colleagues at Middlebury talked about a student going through that in the spring of 2020. That's what I think we need to be taking forward is that sense, sense of collectivism and of coalition. Um, that's the only way that we fight against these systems. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. We have, we have more questions coming in. And Tom, as always, thank you for a very, very deep question. Uh, we have one from Jessica uh, who asks, have you used universal design principles and practices in your work? Um, I'd be happy to speak to that. The answer is yes. Um, UDL is something that I actually thought I would be writing my dissertation on. Um, so years ago, my application into the program was about uh, studying student perceptions of UDL, Universal Design for Learning. But over time, I evolved in my uh, my focus area, and now I'm more looking at open educational practices. But UDL is very much embedded in the way that I teach. And I'm, I'm not here to suggest that I have all the answers, like how to humanize education. But I can tell you that certain um, principles of universal design get some of my colleagues really riled up and they've sort of made it their mission to convince me how wrong I am oh. to, for example, allow for flexible uh, due dates. So in my courses, due dates are suggestions. They are not fixed. I do not penalize. I don't want to see your positive COVID test or your doctor's note or any other personal information. And to me, that's that comes down to respect. That is an act of respect for me. Um, but it also is embedded, embedded in the UDL principles. And another um, assessment strategy that I've been enacting for several years pre-pandemic would be multiple means of representation. So mm -hmm. in courses that are not English courses, um, where maybe it is embedded in the outcomes that students should produce a certain piece of writing. Um, for example, I teach a course on truth and reconciliation. Students are grappling with colonial trauma and, and settler colonial harm. And they communicate their understanding in myriad ways. It's up to them to decide their best strategy. So I've had students podcast their entire course experience, PowerPoints and video and writing if that's what they choose to do. And um, for me, it's led to such a, a refreshing perspective on assessment as conversation and community rather than a punitive um, 
working your way through a checklist that is arbitrary and often completely disconnected from the subject. But my colleagues really, really take issue with this, some of them. Uh, it challenges the status quo in a way that they feel, I think, cheapens the education experience. It's like, no, to be a college graduate, you must APA, you must essay, you must do things in this way. And I'm thinking, but it, my experience has proven out that actually, no, that's not true. And because I was adopting this pre-pandemic, once COVID came around, I found my course structure was quite well equipped to deal with all of this um, trauma that we were all going through. But there are still these institutional limits, right? So for me, why can't the deadline extend beyond the end of the semester? Um, why are we putting these arbitrary t time stamps on education? That's a banking model hangover that has to go. And I'm not saying I know how to replace it in a way that won't um, completely sink me in, in marking from years and years past, but there's got to be a way to do it. And um, I think that UDL is a wonderful place to start because it opens your eyes to different possibilities beyond what you you've experienced in teaching and learning, which tends to be that very rigid way. Um, so I'm so glad that came up. I think for me, it's led to wonderful changes to teaching and learning. Oh, thank you, Jess. Thank you. Uh, any other UDL fans in the panel or should we move on? Well, with that moment of pause, that moment of reflective silence, thank you for the great question, Jessica, and thank you, Jess, for the for the wonderful answer. Um, we have more questions coming up. And by the way, if you want to join us on stage, just please click the raised hand button. Uh, we have a, a question coming in from someone with a fantastically, perfectly spelled first name. I've, I've got to say, I just really admire that. Uh, Brian Maschio says, when students have long and regularly encountered subpar pedagogy, no one concluded in-person instruction doesn't work. How do we counter the analogous response to poorly designed online courses? Good question, well-named Brian. Good question. Well, what do you think? How do we respond? Do we, do we say that online and face-to-face -face are both just you know, domains within the overall realm of instruction? So I will say I shot my mouth off in a big shop meeting once where that's what I said and said, I'm sorry, what's our four year graduation rate? So that's 60 percent. That's working. I don't work there anymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of that. But, so, so I, <laughs> but depending on the crowd, you can sometimes get away with saying, well, let's yeah. just stop for a second and see was this really working? Yeah. I think that's a really important point what Jared is just saying there, which is that we have to point that stuff out when it happens. Too often we just let it go by and we have to like tag these just these these um, disconnects and and shine a light on them and get people to really ask themselves, why am I thinking about this differently than the other? What is different here? I've always I've said for years that I feel like there's an otherness to online education. There's like a the same way we other people, right? And and people who are different than us because they don't share the same markers as us, we, it allows us to think of them differently. Mm -hmm. um, I think we do that in a way with online education versus traditional education, we other it. Mm -hmm. And and it creates a, a distance. And in that distance, we think we have space then to evaluate it differently and um, assess it differently and design it differently. I mentioned earlier in this program, we're doing a design forward for um, at PSU, we're doing a, a program this fall on formats and modalities <laughs> that I have a lot of work to do to get it ready. But what I'm what I really want to do, what I really want to get at there is sort of blow apart a lot of our traditionary that understandings of formats and modalities, which tends to be very binary or mm -hmm. if not binary, just very um, uh, siloed, right? Our understandings of what those those different modalities are. And if there's one thing I think COVID has taught us, it's that modality is really complicated. It's really, really complicated, far more than I think we ever realized. And so rather than shying away from that and going back to how we used to do it, I think we need to continue to kind of dig it up and figure out why is it different? And um, is it really different? Or is it really different in the ways we thought it was different? I guess that's the question I want to ask. 
that's a great, great question. Um, and I love your point about othering. Um, we are almost at the end of our hour and we have, we have some questions coming in and one of them actually, uh, Jared, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's aimed at you, but I think, uh, I think this can also go a bit more broadly. Um, and, uh, this is one from, uh, JM, uh, and JM says in your chapter, quality theater, you suggest an over-reliance on rubrics is going on. How can we know how to meet minimum compliance? Well, I think the first step is having um, a really honest conversation about what is minimum compliance. Because if we're talking about federal regulations, the bar is, I'm going to say pathetically low. The instructor has to show up once or twice. That's the federal regulations. Now, you could have um, area or university things about compliance. But so I think really nailing down exactly what we need. And so when I think of uh, compliance, it's, it's rarely in a positive light. So think, okay, let me step back. Well, let's make sure everything we've got is compliant with, again, we want to keep accreditation. We want to keep our students degrees, having, um, meaning to job prospects and all, we want all of that, but what else? We want our students to connect with faculty. So when I maybe reframing that, like, so when I think about compliance, what does it mean to know your instructor, your online instructor? How can that look? And there's a million ways it can look. Um, but I, I think the first step is really just, no, no, what do we, for real, what do we actually need to, you know, keep, keep the lights on, keep the accreditation? Because I would, I would push to say that bar is actually really low, but there's a lot of urban myth mm -hmm. about what we're supposed to be doing. Good question. And, uh, Jared, thank you for that answer. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious of, of how close we are, and, and I'd kind of like to, to wrap things up a bit. Um, the problem is we've been covering a wide range of ground. Um, you know, at the macro political, the micro political, we've been talking about pedagogy, we've been talking about technology and economics, and the chat box is just on fire. Um, people are just all over the map with that, which is great. A lot of really, really good ideas including just now a big burst of uh, Yvonne Illich um, uh, fandom. Um, I guess, let, let, me, let me just ask the four of you, um, as we all plunge ahead into the 2022, 2023 academic year, when uh, a certain dissertation will no doubt be completed and uh, a certain PhD program will be uh, accelerated, um, I'm wondering what, what kind of advice would you leave for all of us as we look ahead? to this really challenging year as we try to humanize, um, try to make our education more caring, uh, more responsive to students as human beings and accounting for faculty and staff as human beings. What are, what are some of the final parting advice you'd like to give us as we go? And I, I, I do, in the interest of time, I do want to pick on people and I, I'm going to pick on Andrew. Um, um, what, where, would, where would you start, sir? Um, this is a great question. I think I would just, uh, my chapter is kind of about this a little bit. I would remind folks, as I'm constantly reminding myself, that I do not know the first thing about what is really going on in my students' lives. Right? It's very easy for all of us to be preoccupied with our own concerns. We're often overburdened with doing the emotional labor of the university sort of too poor anyway, right? But you really do have the power to situate yourself as an em empathic, humane person in your classroom in relation to your students. Um, and I don't want to pretend that that comes at no cost to you. Again, I think it, it is involved, again, to shoring up this this burden that the university uh, in, in part or in whole, more often than whole, uh, fails to, to do. Um, but but to drawing that lesson, I think, from, from pandemic teaching, especially that um, people's lives are, are complicated. They've been made more complicated by the massive micro and macro scale harms that we've all experienced socially at the familial level, personally. Um, sort of being conscious of um, maybe the limitations of our knowing and how those might figure into our students' presentations or, 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 or absences in the, in the classroom. Um, keeping that in mind is as, as we move forward. It's really, really just a basic thing, but um, if 
find myself in the position again of having to remind myself of it a lot and seeing uh, my colleagues forget it and my instructors forget it too. So, thank you, thank you very much. And if you if you haven't read that, Andrew has a great chapter about uh, among other things legibility uh, and the problems inherent in seeing people and and people disclosing uh, things. I, I don't want to. I can't summarize it without enough justice. Thank you, Indra. Um, Jess, do you want to do you want to jump in? Where sure. Would you um, there is something in in my mind right now. So I I can't remember if I included this in my vignettes or not. But there's an elder on campus, Elder Nokomis Martina Oswalmik. She's a Quemcong First Nation, and she works at Cambrian and other institutions. Um, and she said to me one time. Um, Creator gave us three ears. So she was talking about these and then a third being in your heart. Mm -hmm. and she said there are three ears and only one mouth for a reason. You should do at least three times as much listening as you do talking. And if you can adopt that way, you're mm -hmm. far more likely uh, to to move in a good way. And so that's a teaching that I, I felt compelled to share. I think that that uh, speaks to what Andrew was was uh, talking about as well. And um, I don't always live up to it, but I think it's a good one to remember and try to aspire toward. Eh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I won't say anything more. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe bad advice on a, on a webinar. <laughs> Jared, Jared, what would you, where would you point us? Where, where should we go? Um, despite my slant towards cynicism, I think what I would say is, you know, look around this space, our spaces, my absolute 100 for favorite percent thing about these collections and working with them is I got to see what a lot of people are doing around the world. Really amazing work. They're not doing everything, but they're doing something. And it's pretty spectacular. And so I would just say, keep that in mind. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to fix our higher education system, but you can do something in your space with your coworkers, with your learners, with your administrators, you can do something. And there's like Martha was saying, we're a coalition. We can do something together too. Well, thank you. Thank you, and that's a fin that's a perfect bridge to Martha, both because she, for me, is you know an editor here as well as a writer, but also coalition. She helped assemble a big coalition of all of you for these two great books. Martha, what would you tell us? Um, well, I was going to say that's a perfect ending, but um, <laughs> yeah, sure, I'll, I'll I'll have a go at it. I um, I guess the one thing that I would say because I agree with everything that my co panelists have said is um, just give yourself a break. Um, I feel like that's something I say to people a lot these days when I'm talking to faculty and students is um, cut yourself some slack. Um, I know that's not always easy and I don't want to make it sound easy, but um, these are these are tough times for everybody and holding yourself to an unrealistic standard doesn't help you or anyone else. So be extend grace to yourself first. Mm. And then share it with others. And then share it. Yeah. Martha, thank you. Martha, Andrew, Jared, Jess, I, I can't believe an hour has come and gone. You've been so generous and, and so thoughtful. Uh, everybody grab these two books now. There's a big button <laughs> on the bottom left of the screen. So snag them whichever format you want. Um, what's the uh, um, a three of you at least are on Twitter. I guess that's a good way to keep up with you. Um, if, if you want, if you can throw in the chat any other ways of, uh, of keeping up with you as each of you progress in your important work. Let me just thank you all one more time. This has been a terrific conversation. I admire all of you. Um, please keep up the great work and thank you again. Thank you Brian. so much, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is all my pleasure. But friends, don't go just yet. Um, we need to point out where things are getting next. And I do want to thank all of you for the great questions uh, because that's what makes uh, the forum work. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues, everything from pedagogy to technology to how to extend grace and build coalitions, we can keep talking about this on Twitter. Some of us have been already. Just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events, or take a look at my blog, brianalexander.org, where we talk about these issues. Uh, if you'd like to look back into the past, into our archive, where we've hosted some of these uh, topics many times before, just go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive, and you can find more. 
Uh, if you'd like to look ahead to the next few weeks, we're covering a wide range of topics. As I mentioned before, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. And if you want to share any of your work, any that you are especially proud of, just shoot me a note and I'd be glad to share it with everybody here. Until then, thank you all for a terrific hour. Thank you for the great thinking together and a great conversation. I hope you're all well as the fall semester chugs along. Please take care of yourselves and be safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>